Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another webinar from TUC Education. I'm Anna from the TUC, and I'm delighted to be joined by two fantastic reps who will come to in a minute, but I'm briefly going to uh, just tell you we've got Trevor Redmond from Unison and Janice Turner from VEC2. We'll be hearing more from them shortly. So first of all, just a little bit of our usual housekeeping on the webinar. We've got live captions. Please click the green button at the bottom of the screen that will open a new window where you can follow with live captions if you need to. It's great to see so many of you using the chat panel on the right hand side. Uh, please use that to introduce yourselves, tell us where you're from, your, your workplace, uh, your union, and please use it to exchange any tips and ideas that you, that you might be inspired by after hearing our speakers. We've also got an opportunity for you to ask questions of our speakers. Right at the bottom of the screen, there's an ask a question button. Please post any questions there and I'll try to get to as many as of them as we can after we've heard from Trevor and from Janice. We can't promise to answer them all because we normally get lots, but don't worry, we don't ignore any questions. We take them, um, we take them into consideration when we're writing any guidance for reps going forward. Um, and also, just to remind you all, we are recording today's event. Anyone who's registered will receive a copy of the recording. We'll send you a link um, to the recording, either by the end of today or first thing tomorrow. And we'll also include any resources that are mentioned by our speakers or that you might suggest in the chat panel. So, a little bit about today's subject. We're gonna talk about tackling racism and inequality at work, and more specifically, how workplace reps can negotiate and bargain with their employers around race issues. So we all know that there are lots of issues around racism in the workplace. And um, because we know that union reps can really make a difference in improving things for our members, um, we wanted to hear about work that two fantastic reps have been doing. Um, and also Trevor and Janice are both first time speakers on TUC webinars. So it's really great to have them here and to hear about um, what they've been doing to make a difference. So first of all, Trevor, um, who's from Unison in Brighton, is going to tell us about the work he's been doing. So Trevor, over to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I trust that everyone can hear me. Right. Um, first of all, today is Bastille's Day. And, and if if you are up on your history, it is the day that ushered in the French Revolution in 1789. Right. Moving on from that, this year, 2022, Brighton Hove City Council is celebrating its 25th year of becoming a unitary authority. I'm encouraged by the work the council has been doing towards becoming a fair and inclusive employer and an anti-racist city. My name is Trevor Redmond. I'm Brighton and Hove Unison Branch Officer and a former chair of the Black and Minority Ethnic Workers Forum, and in short, the BMEWF. I was the chair from 2014 until 2018. As trade unionists, there is value for us to operate on the principle that there is strong moral case, that is a strong moral case for all organizations to excel in their equality and diversity practices, and that we all have a role to play in making this a reality. As trade unionists, we, 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 we add value to service improvements, to delivery, and to sustainability. Trade unionists are more than just activists. We are progressive thinkers and visionaries. I'll say this as well. Blind obedience changes nothing. I believe that employees are more likely to have more confidence and trust in their organizations if they believe that they are treated fairly, with dignity and with respect. Staff are more likely to perform well, feel motivated and stay longer at work or stay longer working for the same employers if they feel valued and respected. I also believe that employers are more likely to attract applicants from a wide pool of talented people if they are explicit in their commitment to diversity and demonstrate that through what they do. How did Brighton and Hove City Council get to where we are right now? In 2011, Brighton and Hove City Council was validated 
has been excellent in terms of equality, in terms of the equality framework for local government by the local government association. The black, the black members of the workforce felt that this was the highest validation that could be awarded to, to any organization and that this did not reflect truly where Brighton Hope City Council was at this time. So in 2012, the BME Workers Forum disputed the validation and asked the chief exec at that time for review into race relations into the council. And a company by the name of Global HPO was commissioned to carry out this review. The finding of the review was published in 2013 and our HR produced an action plan to implement the recommendations. In 2014, I was elected the chair of the BME Workers Forum and immediately felt that I needed to raise the profile of the forum if we were to have any real leverage in changing the culture. I started asking HR for workforce data in terms of composition of the workforce, grades, every couple of months. I was making myself a nuisance in other words. I was showing an interest in the establishment as well as, uh, as making sure that we had an established principle of having that data or in HR passing that data onto the BME Workers Forum. The council's workforce profile was at that time not reflective of the community it served. And improvements were not being made to address this. Many staff were experiencing discrimination and inequality. I asked for a fair recruitment and retention and career progression opportunities for BME members of the workforce. In 2015, I asked for by monthly meetings with the head of HR or the and that was granted. The reason for that was because I wanted to discuss people's issues with the head of HR so that we can make plans for improvement. At these meetings, I discussed secondments acting up and just simply why BME persons were not being, were not getting employed into, the, in, into jobs within the council. In 2016, at the Workforce Equality Group meeting, and that was normally held, you know, that was held every couple of months, and the, the, the chair of that was the head of HR OD. So in 2016, at one of these meetings, I stated that the BME Workers Forum felt that there was that there was a lack of, of meaningful progress in implementing the, the recommendation of the Global HPO review that took place in 2012 with the recommendations that were put forward in 2013, and that we, the BME Workers Forum, would not continue to give the council, you know, all the things that it wanted from us, you know, responding to 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 um, inquiries about things that were concerning the community, etc. We thought that we would not continue to give the council any of that, any of our services without anything in return. So basically, we would tell our, our support and contribution to various initiatives that the council was having. But we continued to attend meetings without speaking. We would we refused to endorse any initiative that the council was seeking to do. At Nikoti's meeting that was held by the chief exec, I remember being asked to endorse a report that was going to the LGA, Local Government Association, to show how well the council was doing in terms of equalities. The report started off by saying, that we are pleased with the progress and I wasn't. So I refused to, to endorse this report. And I said, the only reason that the BME could endorse this report is if we change the words, we are pleased to, we are encouraged. Following that, the council went for, for, the, um, for the award again. And this time, instead of being given excellent, they were given achieving. This I felt was more reflective of, of where the council truly was, was at. In 2017, the BME Workers Forum met with the chief exec and the head of HR and asked for a follow-up review of, in terms of equalities because the previous review and recommendations were not being implemented. And in fact, we didn't get much further than, than the action plan. This was agreed. As part of the review, the chief exec and the senior executive leadership team agreed that what would happen is that all the top managers, 100 top managers within the council, along with the trade unions and the workers forums, four workers forums, the 
LGBT Workers Forum, the Women's Network, the Disabled Persons and, and Carers Network, and the BME Workers Forum will all be part of that consultation process. Prior to this review, I started to ask for more information, including evidence of secondments acting up and uh, evidence in terms of BME staff being involved in disciplinary and grievances. With this information, I was able to go to, to meetings with, with the council and say, look, listen, we're not doing enough. I also asked for all JDs and process of education to be rewritten and to make sure that instead of just asking for qualifications, you know, we must make sure that the, those qualifications were genuine occupational requirement, not just put on there because someone felt it might be a good thing to do. This was accepted. And what we asked to do, the BME Works for Marks, is that what they should do instead as well is to have, you know, in terms of this person's a requirement that said that if you have an equivalent, uh, an equivalent relevant experience, then that would be acceptable. The new review took place in 2018 and a report was produced to the council later that year. On the findings of the recommendations, the Global HBO recommended that the council should, along with its, its, its managers and their unions and, and the workers forum, co-create what is now a fair and inclusive action plan. Brighton North City Council have had for a long time very good policies and practices. But unfortunately, there was a problem. And the problem was managers were not following them. Policies and, 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 and procedures are only as good as the workforce who are there and who are prepared to implement them. As the chair of the BME Workers Forum and with the support of allies in the trade union, I spoke at every opportunity I got, including staff meetings, workforce equality group meetings, and when invited to the executive leadership team meetings that was normally chaired by chief exec, I went and I spoke, always pushing the point that equality should be a priority for the organization. Our work on equalities was allied by the trade unions, branch secretary, and later, you know, the branch secretary for unions and encouraged me to, to become a union rep, which I did. The issue also with the council is that we had 54 elected councillors within the city, but none of them were from the black and minority ethnic community. That meant that the voices of the community were not being heard. So in 2016-17, I asked for the council to, to consider approving co-opted members onto the decision-making committees. And that was agreed in 2019. So whilst the progress was slow, it was still happening. I think it was right for this to happen as there was no person on any of the council committees to be a conduit for the voice of the BME community. The BME workforce collaboration, collaboration with our trade unions and colleagues and allies across the council is very important in this. So what, if I can leave you with some tips, I would say this, people are the most valuable resource of our trade union. What we should be looking to do is find out what is important to our members and be the conduit to deliver the message for them to our managers or to their managers. I think we should identify allies, sympathizers, and those who have leverage it in our organizations and build a network with those. Every meeting is an opportunity to influence change and we should use it. I think we must be good listeners. We must ask questions and don't be afraid to ask questions. Ask for information and use the evidence to support our case always. We must be more visible, that is important. And we must most of all be patient. We must be patient but persistent, even at the risk of something like a broken record because it's through that persistence that we get change. Change doesn't happen overnight, and sometimes we just need to keep on and on and on. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Trevor. That was so inspirational. And um, I've actually noted down quite a few points you made um, in terms of like practical tips for reps. I think the bit that you said at the end about um, repetition at the risk of sounding like a broken record is fantastic. We just keep mentioning it. Every meeting is an opportunity and ask, listen to your members, report your members' feelings to management. So on that note, before we take some of the questions from the audience, um, we're going to hand over to Janice, who is from Beck2. So Janice, can we hear about what you've been doing with Beck2 to um, tackle racism and bargain around inequality at work? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, so my name is Janice Turner and I'm the diversity officer at Beck2, which is a sector of prospect. So many people might imagine collective bargaining as a negotiation meeting with an employer about the latest pay claim. For 20 years, the Beck2 Black Members Committee and I have been running major initiatives involving hundreds of employers, which are also collective bargaining, in that we have acted collectively on behalf of ethnic minority members to persuade the employers to adopt a course of action on race in the workplace. And although they've taken different forms each time, there's a common underlying approach. I'll start by explaining our underlying methodology of how we did it. Then I'll take you through what we did and I'll explain the benefits that resulted, including unexpected benefits because it resulted in substantial additional benefits for the union that we hadn't anticipated. If you think about how a union might usually do collective bargaining on pay and conditions, most people might describe it along the lines of consult the members about what the issues are and what their priorities are, get the best understanding you can of those issues and priorities, work out how to address them and then try to persuade the employer to go along with it. And doing collective bargaining on race is just the same. Um, is the PowerPoint is, is the PowerPoint on screen at the moment? It's not, but keep going and I'll, I'll get it up. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. I, I just wondered. Um, so just to explain our underlying methodology. So first and foremost, everything we've done has been discussed directed and approved by the union's black members committee which has representatives from across the union and this has been absolutely essential because it ensures that whatever the union's doing on race equality has been agreed with black workers we've begun with a discussion about what the main problems are that are faced by black workers in a sector it's crucial to understand in detail what black what uh, black workers themselves see as the key issues facing them not just the general term racism but how the racism is manifesting itself in practice and how specifically it is impacting on black workers the big question is what issues do black workers want the trade union to prioritize in addressing it could be underrepresentation or racist abuse or it could be failure to promote or the fact that white managers are getting bonuses, but I think minority managers aren't. The answer is most likely going to be different in different workplaces or industries. When we've got the answer to this question and we've done further research on it to gain the best understanding we can, then the logical response, what the union can do about it, starts to become apparent. And we would say that um, if, the, if you know, the, there are different uh, solutions depending on um, the, the the workforce or the members involved but if you but if the issue needs you to think big I would encourage you to think big so then you develop your plan and you get the support and cooperation of the relevant part of the union for it and at the appropriate point you address you approach the employers what we found in the film broadcasting and theater industries is that there are many people who want to do something about racism they want to do the right thing and have the right processes but often they're not sure what to do and they're afraid that if they do or say the wrong thing they'll be accused of being racist so if a trade union comes along with a positive plan and reaches out in partnership we have found employers responding very warmly to our offer a trade union has got several options when an employer doesn't have the diverse workforce that they should have we could point the finger at them and simply attack them and demand that they do better or we can actually get involved and we can make it easier for them to do what we want them to do. We can work out specifically what it is that they should be doing. And then we can do all the difficult preparatory work for them or with them if we think that would get the problem solved. We then present it to them and invite them to run with it. So the key elements of our approach are ensuring that it's a response to what black workers say is the issue, working continuously with the black members committee and making it easy for the employers to do what we want them to do usually in our case by doing much of the work for them. There are three main initiatives I'd like to tell you about that have proved to be successful. The first is Move On Up. 
black workers in film and TV production said that not getting work in the industry or not being able to move up the ladder is the big issue. The feature film and TV programme production sector is overwhelmingly freelance and jobs are often got through who you know and who recommends you. Black workers said that they were not in the right networks, so they had no chance of even hearing about a job, let alone getting it. So if not being in the right networks was the issue, this could be addressed by getting people into these networks. So we devised a simple solution. We'd invite the employers to put forward executives who had the power to hire crews or commission people to make programmes. We'd advertise the lineup and ask ethnic minority professionals, who do you want to have a one-to-one -one with? They would send the union their CV and we'd forward it to everyone they wanted to see. The executives had to read all the CVs and give the union their list of up to 12 people that they could see in a one-day event. And I would then timetable hundreds of 20-minute one-to-one meetings to take place about 60 at a time, all on the same day. We convinced our general secretary and it took us several months for us to build the support of the employers for the event. The first employer to throw their weight behind it was the BBC. We then went to other employers like ITV and Channel 4 and told them the BBC was supporting it, so they, they agreed too. The BBC, which never does anything by half, put forward about 40 executives. The other broadcasters also put forward about another 40 between them. And I have to say we're incredibly grateful to the TUC for their support because they let us borrow Congress Hall for the day. The event was to assist black professionals to move on up in their careers, and so that's what we called it. And we even played Curtis Mayfield's theme tune at the opening. On the day, more than 500 meetings took place between about 80 film and broadcasting executives and 250 ethnic minority professionals. The whole event was buzzing. Interestingly, the tables were gently turned on the executives as the white people were the ethnic minority and the hundreds of experienced ethnic minority professionals present in one room really opened people's eyes. Hundreds of new contacts were made. And our survey afterwards showed that 10% of the black workers had actually got jobs as a result of the contacts made. Imagine that, black workers going around the industry who could say the union got me a job. Everybody, employers, executives, black workers, wanted the union to do it again. So from 2003 to 2015, we ran 10 events at the request of the employers. We'd managed to get EU funding for four of them, but when that dried up, the BBC stepped in and funded it. We also went along with the employers' request to run them for radio and news with George Alagaya and Sir Trevor MacDonald speaking, and in the north of England. People continued to get jobs, programme commissions and other opportunities from it. An unemployed producer in Manchester got to be the series producer of several BBT, BBC Two network series. He said the union put food on his children's table. Several presenters got jobs such as Tina De Healy, who's now a Radio 1 presenter, Craig Rowe on QVC and ITV, Andy ekin Waleri, who became a presenter on Blue Peter. Some black BBC staff got meetings with executives in other parts of the BBC to help their BBC careers. Janice, can I just get you to pause there for one second? Sure. Can you just slow down a tiny bit, just because our live captioner um, wants to capture everything you're saying because it's so great. <laughs> but just slow down a little bit would sure. be fantastic. Okay. okay, but it's so great to hear what you've been doing. Thank you. So by 2015, the union had set up 6,000 one-to-one meetings between 2,000 ethnic minority professionals and 800 executives from all the main broadcasters. Sky hates unions, but even Sky News took part. And what started as a Black Members Committee initiative ended up with squads of union officials and activists doing a mass recruitment drive on the day. And the union benefited in several ways. People across the industry we're talking about the union in a very positive way. We were setting the agenda. It encouraged a more positive relationship with the employers as we were working together on a practical initiative that really worked. It increased trust. The employers were calling it the industry's flagship diversity event. Beck2 gained a good reputation among black workers as it proved that the union was delivering for them. Ethnic minority union membership grew in some areas massively. Ethnic minority membership among freelance film and TV workers outside London more than tripled from 21 to 73 after one event. And then when Black Lives Matter happened in the middle of the pandemic, when everything was on Zoom, many union branches emailed in asking how they could help to fight racism. So the Black Members Committee suggested that each branch do a move on up event, small scale, 
on Zoom. And they did. Inevitably, it was called Zoom on Up. Freelance employers are often in the same branch as the people they hire, for example, camera branch. So senior workers in the branch were meeting ethnic minorities who were fellow branch members. And we thought this was wonderful, that union branch committees were helping black fellow branch members to move on up in their departments. That's real workers' solidarity. All the branches that did this now have equality committees that are taking forward their own initiatives. So the second big initiative that we did was launched in 2018. Black union members in theatres identified underrepresentation in theatre workplaces as the big issue for them. Most employers in the theatre industry are very small, often with not a lot in the form of an HR department. Theatres have permanent staff, but they are supplemented by a lot of casuals. And you have to know how to get into the industry. And particularly with casuals, it's often who you know again. In theatre, the black workers simply aren't there in any numbers. Only about 6% of the workforce in West End theatres were ethnic minority, despite being about 40% of Londoners. So any plan has to be about how theatres recruit. So we set up a joint working group between the union's Black Members Committee and experienced Beck to Theatre trade union reps volunteering from the main union committees covering theatre. And together we got to the bottom of how theatres really recruit workers in practice. With that knowledge, we developed the Theatre Diversity Action Plan. This was a really simple step-by-step -step guide for employers, showing them very clearly what they're supposed to do. It couldn't have been clearer. It basically said, number one, do this. Number two, do this. Number three, do this. And it wasn't rocket science. I'm sure you'll all know what would be in it. Do equality monitoring, see if you've got a problem, set targets, find out whether there are no ethnic minority applications for jobs, or there are, but they never get the job. Then advice on what to do, depending on what that answer is. But people who've never thought about increasing ethnic minority representation in their workforce don't know this. The plan was agreed by the union's governing committee for the theatre industry, and our industrial colleagues then pr proposed it to the employers. They took it to the two big theatre employers association who, after a bit of persuasion, endorsed it, and we put their statement of support at the front of the action plan. Then my colleagues wrote to individual theatres. We launched it at the Coliseum of the English National Opera in 2018 with the Mayor of London and the actors Adrian Lester and Kwame Kweyama, along with the, museum, the, the musician Chichi Nwanoku OBE and more than 130 theatres signed up. But we needed the employers to reach ethnic minority potential job applicants. So we set up a partnership between the union, the Department for Work and Pensions and the London Job Centres, and then got the West End employers together and invited them to send all their vacancies to one email address. And they would be circulated right across London's job centres with an encouragement to black workers to apply. This didn't cost us anything really, but it resulted in ethnic minority and white unemployed Londoners getting jobs in West End theatres where they hadn't before until COVID hit and all the theatres shut down. We also did this in Cardiff. We followed all this up when Disney, who'd signed up to the action plan, approached the union to discuss how to reach ethnic minority workers for their theatre productions, Lion King and Frozen. So we introduced Disney to Notting Hill Carnival. Notting Hill Carnival has a network of 9,000 people who make the carnival happen. It's a huge untapped resource of black talent in live entertainment. The third and final example I want to give you is our commercials diversity action plan. While Move On Up was the union reaching out and working with the employers in partnership on a union initiative, and the theatre action plan was us politely presenting the employers with a fait accompli and requesting their support, the commercials initiative began with the employers approaching us. The commercial industry is comprised of hundreds of mainly small companies that make the adverts that you see on television and in the cinema and online. The Advertising Producers Association represents these companies and we have agreements with them covering pay and conditions for freelance workers in commercials. When Black Lives Matter began, 
They saw Bektu's record on rate equality initiatives, and so they approached us, asking if we could work with them to develop a response. So we readily agreed and proposed a joint union employer working group, which turned out to be the best joint working group I've ever seen. It comprised black members committee members, plus a multiracial lineup of union members and employers' representatives. The employers wanted an action plan like our theatre plan for the commercials industry. The main issue identified, again, was underrepresentation of black workers. So together, we got the employers and the workers to confirm how crews are actually hired to work on commercials. Then we discussed how the employers might do things better and brought in another very simple step-by-step -step guide for the production companies. And we included web addresses of sources of experienced freelance ethnic minority professionals and new entrants to remove the excuse that they can't find any. The employers also agreed to the introduction of two schemes to bring new people in. One was a shadowing scheme for black professionals who have the skills, but are working somewhere else, such as in feature films. The other was a new entrance training scheme. It was also agreed that anyone on these schemes would be paid a minimum of £250 a day. I have to say it's a very high earning industry on account of the tiny duration of freelance jobs. But the working group recognised that there's no point trying to hire more black workers if they're treated so badly that they leave. So the union and the employers agreed a code of conduct on all productions. But the biggest new thing of all was the creation of a new discrimination complaints procedure. In the Zoom meetings discussing Black Lives Matter, racist abuse while working on productions in film and television was raised by black workers again and again. Most TV commercials only take a day or two to shoot. So when a racist incident happens, by the time somebody makes a complaint, the commercial may well have finished, the workplace no longer exists, and nobody is employed by the company anymore. And there were no procedures the freelancers could turn to. So I took ACAS's official guidance for permanent staff and created a new discrimination complaints procedure for employers of freelancers. It covered all forms of discrimination, bullying, harassment, and it committed the employers to investigating and acting on complaints even after the production had finished and they weren't employing anyone anymore. We also wrote Bektu by name into the complaints procedure, setting out what members can expect the union to do for them, whether they were the complainant or the subject of the complaint. It emphasised that everybody is expected to call out any abuse and the complaints procedure was for witnesses to use as well as victims. We had to invent suitable remedies for when a complaint is upheld. Don't forget, everyone involved is likely to be self-employed and only hired for a day or two, so first written warnings are irrelevant. So it could be an apology or mediation or training or to have to recognise that such behaviour meant that the employer may not want to hire them again. And that is a serious threat because it is a small industry where word gets round. And the employers agreed to all this. The Employers Association and 120 commercials employers signed up to the action plan and it's been in force since November. And we had our first complaint under it recently and I was, I was delighted that it worked really well. So the benefits of this were, of course, that for the first time in the commercials industry's history, we've got a union agreement with the industry setting out hiring procedures, code of conduct, a commitment to equality monitoring, targets, new diversity schemes and a discrimination complaints procedure covering the freelance workforce. And what we're trying to do in our union is to transfer it into TV drama production as soon as we can. The new commercials action plan has not only already increased black employment in commercials and improved the working life of those under it, it has also brought about a substantial improvement in the relationship between the union and the employers association. There was a unity of purpose between the union and the employers. It built trust. And when one group of freelancers' pay was up for negotiation at the end of last year, they got a 10% pay increase. And reports from one of the employers who used the action plan and massively succeeded in hiring diverse crews told us that all the reports they'd had from their productions were that there was a brilliant atmosphere on all these productions. It was so much better. And they all said it was because of the diversity. So to conclude, our experience has shown that successful collective bargaining on race increases black workers' respect for and awareness of the union. It brings black workers into union membership 
as the union can prove that it's delivering for them. And it gives the union the means to increase the number of black activists and reps. Working hand in hand, collaborating with the Black Members Committee ensures that action is responding to what black workers believe is needed. It can improve the relationship with employers. It puts the union in a very positive light across the industry and gets people talking about the union in a different way. We found collective bargaining on race equality at an industry or sector level to be successful and efficient. It has the advantage of pushing change at loads of companies all at the same time. And I'm sure some employers have felt safety in numbers. It resulted in 6,000 meetings for 2,000 black workers with 800 executives from all major broadcasters and news media and race action plans that have won the support of more than 250 companies across the theatre and commercials industries. Black workers got jobs. Everybody wins. So the message from Beck2 is that if you see collective bargaining on race equality as organising practical action on race with the employers, then you've got a world of opportunity in front of you. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Um, and again, I think you mentioned so many helpful tips of things uh, that reps can do in the workplace. And while many reps don't have the benefit of, let's put it, famous colleagues, uh, newsreaders or uh, Radio 1 DJs, um, I think if that doesn't matter. They can absolutely still uh, learn from things like the uh, Move On Up or Zoom On Up events. Mentoring and networking is always important, so I'm just checking my notes. But I think some of the... Um, the, the uh, most important pieces of advice you gave were things around creating a clear action plan and making it step by step. And actually, bargaining and negotiating 101 for reps is the same no matter what the subject. It's talk to your members, do your research and get your evidence and talk to management and repeat. OK, we're going to take a look at some of the questions that have been posted by the audience in a second. But a couple of little things from me first. Um, my colleagues here at the TUC in our media team um, are on the lookout for anyone who might be happy to talk to them or, and talk to journalists about their experiences of racism at work. Now, we know that this is not an easy subject for anyone to talk about, um, so there's no pressure at all. If you feel it's something you could do, um, and we'd help you through it. You, you'd talk to uh, one of my colleagues who would help uh, prepare you for this um, and for speaking with a journalist. Um, and we would ask that if you, if you are willing to do this, the, you, you, you'd be able to give us your name. We, 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 um, we, we'd, we'd like to be able to um, talk to you um, rather than you anonymously, if that's okay. If this is something you are interested in, please do drop me, my team, an email at tuceducation at tuc.org.uk. We'll put that email address in the chat on the right hand side and we'll also include it in the email that we send out later today. Um, but yes, if you are interested in talking to us about that, because the more coverage we get on this issue, the more it is uh, people aware of it and the more the employers are aware of it and it only helps us in um, making a difference in the workplace on this. Okay, let's take a look at the questions that we've received. So there's actually a couple that I'm going to answer first uh, before we go back to Trevor and to, uh, to Janice. Um, right, so there is a question about what the TUC is doing, about um, to see what the TUC has done around inequality in the workplace and whether we can share any findings. Uh, yes, absolutely. I have um, several colleagues who are working on this particular issue. We have a project called the Anti-Racism Task Force and we have posted the link to the web page um, about uh, that work in uh, we'll post the web page to that in the chat. My, uh, Tanya's just posted that up now. So do take a look. Um, that project has got four main areas of work, one of which is um, about how, um, seeing what unions are doing as employers, because um, we know that there may be problems within those organisations as well. And there is a section of the work um, that looks at that. So do check that out. Um, OK, I'm going to... Um, pose our first question 
to you first, Trevor, give Janice a little bit of a break. Um, so do you have any tips on how we can get more black health and safety reps involved in the workplace? And also, can you add why you think it's important that we have black and other BME um, reps as union reps? Okay, thanks so much for that question. Um, I think, first of all, it's very important that um, every person who's in employment join a union. And I think it's important that the trade unions um, reach out um, to all members within the workforce to say, listen, you are welcome. Because generally, you know, people go to where they feel most welcome. I'm in Unison because I feel I'm welcomed by Unison. Unison also have a black members group that that deals with issues uh, regarding uh, black members, etc. So it's important that we 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 are part of that that of that body. And the more they say BME or black members can see or workforce can see mem you know people that look like them in positions within the trade union, whether it be as a contact person, a, a, rep, a rep or a steward or, or a, an officer, they will feel more inclined to maybe want to do so. And if we can, I think sometimes as well, what, what people need to do is, is, is go out and say to others, listen, we welcome you. We'd like to know what, 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 is, what is impacting on you at your workplace or, or even invite them to come and join the, the organization. Being a, a being a, a, an health and safety rep is very important because you're covered by the um, the Health and Safety at Work Act, you know, 1974, I think it is, right? And and that gives you an insight into so many different things, you know, you know, uh, around the council, uh, or, or around your, your workplace, you know, you you making sure that not just in terms of of the physical space, but make sure people's well being, and make sure that the organisation recognises that it has a responsibility um, to its workforce all the time. You know, um, a duty of care um, uh, on the on the, the the Equalities Act, etc. You know, so it's important that we have that. You know, we have people that that are not necessarily as role models, but images of ourselves within the union, and that will attract more people to it. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. I think that's um, a really good point there about. Um, you see people like yourself and that makes uh, someone feel more welcome um, in, you know, possibly in uh, that they might feel able to step up to that role a little bit more. Um, OK, I've got um, a question specifically for you, Janice, because it relates more directly to what you're speaking about. Uh, so you talk, talked quite a bit about recruitment. Um, have you found that the biggest barriers to black workers are at the recruitment stage to enter organizations in the first place or is it progression once they're in or is it both um i i would probably say both actually um but quite clearly one depends on the other um there's you've got no chance at all of progressing anyway in an organization if you can't get you can't get into the organization in the first place clearly um and and so i would again be guided by what the black members in an organization tell me is the issue. So, I mean, it, it, it could be quite obvious that if you work in, a, in an institution where it is simply an all-white institution, well, the branch knows what its, what its homework is there. They know what the agenda is. And, you know, that's, that's quite clear. But if you have an institution um, where you consult ethnic minority members, if they believe that the issue is failure to progress, then that is the issue that you ought to prioritize. Thanks, uh, Janice. I think that was really helpful. Um, Trevor, I've got a question specifically for you from one of our viewers. Um, uh, our viewer asks, says, your was a really interesting talk on what you've been doing. Um, they would like to know your views on whether you think employers use staff networks as a way to bypass or even ignore the union. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the relationship between your staff networks and the recognized union um, at the council, please. Okay, thanks very much. Very good question, very useful. Uh, first of all, um, you know, the trade unions are a people organization, so is the workers' forum, right? And sometimes because we have a workers' forum, yes, some employees might seek to bypass the union, et cetera, but that, 
that can never really happen because the union has a statutory right within an organization and it, it, it within the law it says that the organization must consult with the trade unions so you trade unions basically have more more authority than the workers forum yeah so so that can't happen i think what we need to do as we have been doing is working collaboratively with with with, with the trade unions you know or there needs to be collaboration between the trade unions and the workers forums right that helps both sides one in terms of recruitment in terms of the trade union they can attract um members from the bme to the to the trade union and in terms of the workers forum it means that when we're making efforts to 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 or to have leverage in terms of equality and diversity within the organization and fairness in how, in how we treat it then the trade unions are there as a support to you know because they can see the value of it you know and one of the things we must we must understand that and i said this in my speech is that trade unions are not just activists you know they are important in terms of service delivery in terms of welfare in terms of of of, of people's well-being and so on productivity sustainability and without that you know without that you know the organizations wouldn't fare as well as as they do people are the most valuable resource that an organization will have you know whether or not we're in the trade unions or in the workers forum you know we must recognize that and coming together and working collaboratively will always be the best approach to, to make sure that we you know we get the best results Organizations might try to, to separate and ask one for information and, the, and not the other, etc. But if you're working together, as as I know, this has happened uh, here in, in in Brighton. You know, I've had the, the you know the chair of the organization has come to me and says, "Trev, have you heard of this?" You know, and I would go back to the to the workers' forum and says, "Have we heard about this?" Because I'm no longer in the executive committee. I'm 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 a, I'm a lay member now. But I would say, have we heard about this? And if we haven't, then we can start asking questions. Well, hang on, this relates to equality. Why have we not been, been con consulted with regards to this? And likewise, when I hear things that are happening within the workers' forum, I can say to the, the trade unions, my, you know, the branch secretary and other colleagues, have you heard this? Do you know about this? Yes, especially where consultation is taking place, you know, just behind closed doors, because we only have members come to me and say, well, Trev, this is what's happening. You know what's happening, and I can say to the units, "Are you aware of this?" And only by having that 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 link, that 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 friendship, that collaboration, that we're able to make sure that nothing gets passed without either of us seeing them, or without both of us, both union and the workers forum, having some knowledge about it. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Um, it seems like from your experience, uh, it's like a belt and braces approach that you've that you found works for you. Um, OK, I've got a couple of questions that I'm going to put to each of you in turn now, because I think that, um, you know, you, you'll both have some things to say. OK, so you first, Janice. Do you have any strategies for areas of the country that might have um, a different ethnic makeup to perhaps London or other big cities where there is a lot of diversity um, in areas that are less diverse? What tips or advice would you give to reps working in those geographical areas? Well, one of the one of the things that we've always felt was important was to I mean, as, as Trevor said earlier, that, you know, look at the data. Um, and so one thing we would do is is we would say have a look at what the uh, ethnic makeup is of the area that you're representing and see if we see if you represent that. The other issue, of course, is um, the uh, the employers that you are working with. Um, what do they say about their recruitment? Are they saying that they recruit on a national basis or are they saying they recruit on a local basis? Because one of the things that has that um, is, is really quite dangerous um, that we've seen for many years is that you see employers um, in for example, London, where there's 40% uh, of the population's ethnic minority um, saying that, oh, well, you see, we, we recruit on a national basis. And so uh, the target they're looking for is something like 14%. And if, if the London and Birmingham and Leeds and Leicester employers and Manchester are all looking at national figures and the employers in the local areas say, oh, well, we, we don't look at the national figures, we're only looking at the local figures, then what it means is there is always going to be underrepresentation of ethnic minorities in the workplace right across the country. So I would be saying that um, if you're 
working with employers in a uh, in in an area where there is uh, less than the national average of ethnic minority employment. The first the first argument I would put to them is, well, you're a big employer, you don't recruit on a local basis, and and so this you know diversity is just as important to that employer as it is to any other, and so they should be setting targets appropriate to that. But also, I would be saying, well. You know, if 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 they're in a low area, uh, an area that's that has a, a a low number of ethnic minority workers, that doesn't mean that you can just ignore the issue. You know, so so I think it's a case of looking at which at, at the the employers that you're working with, and looking at how they recruit, and then saying to yourself, well, actually, you know, this is the way that the employer could improve, and then and then getting in there and helping them do so as well, actually, because I think if the employer actually tries to play a constructive role sometimes that can help employers to do things where if you if you left them to try to do it on their own they're not going to do anything thanks Janice I think that's a really important point that you made at the end that um, you need to help employers to actually take these steps um, and workplace reps are often in a great position to do that uh, Trevor would you like to add anything to that about uh, less diverse areas of the country and any advice that you might have for people I think Janice has answered that well but what I would say is this you know employers will always have excuses and always find excuses why they're not meeting um, local targets in terms of recruitment and selection. It will happen whether it be um, when they're seeking to attract from the diverse pool of talent outside of the organization or when they or even when they're looking within the organization to promote persons or to have to give them opportunities for career development, whether it's by secondment, uh, acting up, uh, and so on. They'll always find excuses, right? And I will say this to that, those, uh, those organizations and those managers, right? Truly, what it is that you're seeking to do, right? And because every person within society can add value to your organization. And if you have a, if you have a diverse workforce, you bring a diverse, let's say, range of talents that could help your organization, you know? Uh, so if you say you, you, you're based locally, but you re recruit on a national basis, you're deliberately decreasing the, 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 the chances of, those persons who could add value to your organization. And I think those organizations must be encouraged to, to look at the local talent base and make sure that their employment um, policies and procedures and their targets reflect the, lo the local um, areas that they are working, that they, are, that they are, are, are working in or they are working from, rather than say nationally. You know, you, you, you're local. So why not employ persons who, who, who are from within the locality within which you your business is operating. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Um, before we just take another question, I want to highlight a uh, comment that's just come up in the chat. It's, it's the one at the bottom there saying um, that Lizzie has said that um, in her workplace, they've just recently recruited specific equality reps. And the bonus is that they all happen to be co-leads of the staff networks. So they feel like they're in a much better position now they've got that link up. Um, I appreciate this might not be possible in every workplace, but it sounds like um, a way forward if it is possible. OK, um, let me just see what other questions we've got. Um, OK, so um, one of our audience has asked, um, said that sometimes employers um, try to address a lack of diversity and inclusion by um, appointing a black equality, diver diversity and inclusion manager to cover this. And then they maybe carry out surveys on this issue. Um, and they are wary that perhaps the employer isn't addressing the issue itself, but hiding behind the above appointment and the survey, which has perhaps already been done and not worked. So um, have you got any experience of perhaps an employer doing this or something else that doesn't really tackle the issues and maybe just ticks a box? Janice, have you got anything to add on that first? There's, there's actually quite a recent example, actually. There's, there's some... I know of one employer, and I better not say which one it is, but there was, there was one employer um, that that did have uh, a diversity officer um, who obviously, you know, had that role, um, and they it, it 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 did seem to be that that kind of thing, doing surveys and 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 um, 
you know, not, not really tackling the issue. The employer did have, uh, on paper, the employer had some good procedures, but uh, what the rep found, what the reps found in that company was that even though they had they were they had the right thing on paper, it just wasn't being followed. Um, and so, rather than simply thinking, you know, there's the head of diversity. I think this is where the union can say to ourselves, okay, what what is it that we want to happen? What do we think is the problem? So, you know, the union would talk to ethnic minority workers and say, you know, what do you think is the issue? What do you want the union to do about it? What would you like the employer? You know what changes should be made, and then the union could proactively um, come up with what they think the employer should do, and then go to the employer and suggest that. So, in in this in, in the case I'm thinking of, several ethnic minority workers had had been pushed out effectively from the organisation, and it did seem to be the same department that was doing it, and there was a there was a head of department that seemed to be in the frame for this, and when the um, when it was, well, the rep decided to look at it all in great detail and produced a report that was sent to management that went through several particularly bad examples. Um, and um, the, the the employer attempted to sort of, um, they, they did an investigation, but it wasn't, you know, it, it sort of papered over the cracks. And so the rep then came back and basically destroyed the, the, the arguments that were put by the employer. And it was it was actually really effective because after a while um the the rep found out that the manager that was in the frame uh is leaving in september uh and so basically persistence and and really just you know not not just letting the employer to um uh paper over it actually being proactive putting the facts and being persistent with it that really paid off Thanks, Janice. Um, and I think that alludes to your um, to the, some of the uh, issues that Trevor raised earlier. Persistence, uh, keep like knocking at the door, make a bit of a nuisance of yourself, present the evidence. Um, but speaking of Trevor, I think we've actually lost him for a minute. He's um, maybe got some difficult connection, connectivity issues. Um, but we have uh, sped through very nearly an hour, so um, I am gonna I am gonna wrap up in a second. Um, just to remind you that if you are happy or keen to find out more about working with the TEC uh, media team on uh, your experiences of racism at work, please do email us at tuceducation at tuc.org.uk. Um, that email will come to me and my team and we will get in touch with you and uh, put you back in touch with um, my, my colleagues in media. Hi again, Trevor. It's great you've, you've come back. Uh, we, yeah, we lost you for a second. Um, and also to um, remind you to check out the TUC's Anti-Racism Task Force webpage, which we have shared the, uh, we've shared the info for in the chat. We'll make sure it's included in the webinar that's going out later. Um, part of the work that the Anti-Racism Task Force is doing includes some video help guides on negotiating. So they're producing those at the moment and they'll be ready later this year. Uh, so watch watch this space um you'll find out about them soon um and also just to remind you whether you're a regular tc webinar viewer or whether you're new um that we are going to be holding a face-to-face -face event in october so as um as i hope uh, comes across we really love connecting with you all via a screen we think that's been great over the past two years and we're not stopping doing that we're going to keep doing that but we also want to meet some of you face to face so we'll be sending out um registration link for that soon please do sign up come along meet us from the tuc and meet some of the speakers that we've had on these events you'll be able to ask them your questions in person and get really great tips from them about how you can make a difference in the workplace so um all that remains is for me to thank janice and to thank uh trevor for joining us today um you've been brilliant and um i hope you've seen some of the thanks that have been popping up in the um in the chat panel because people will uh um, I really appreciate that. Also, thank you, you, the audience, for joining us because you've offered some really great insights and some great questions. And we'll see you all next week for our last webinar before the summer break. 
um, which is about how you can support uh, pregnant colleagues um, around risk assessments and um, things you need to be aware of when they return from work. Thank you all for joining us. See you all again soon. Bye bye.